Returning to Istanbul from his campaign in Baghdad, Murad IV fell ill. In 1640, he died from cirrhosis of the liver. Sources claim that the Sultan consumed a significant amount of alcohol, which ironically became his sworn enemy, leading to his demise. However, the Sultan strictly prohibited alcohol consumption within the Ottoman Empire and harshly punished those who violated this rule. Before his death, he issued a series of decrees. The first decree concerned a grand celebration, while the last decree pertained to the strangulation of his own brother, Ibrahim I, who would have been the sole heir to the throne. It is likely that as death neared, Murad IV wished to end the dynasty by his own hand and leave a legacy in history as the last and greatest sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Understanding that such a turn of events meant the loss of all her power, their mother, Kursum Sultan, decided to take a clever action. She sent a false message to Murad IV, which stated, The order for the execution of Ibrahim has been carried out. When this note reached the Sultan's hands, he let out his final breath, shifting his face into a grim smile. Ibrahim was then 24 years old and had spent his entire life in isolation, in the so-called cage. His cage was a two-story grey building hidden behind high walls in the centre of the Grand Palace. Its internal architecture mirrored that of a Sultan's sanctuary. The first floor had no windows, and those on the second floor only faced the sea. The unfortunate princes who found themselves in this place either awaited a grim strangulation after some time or a sudden ascension to the throne after many years of confinement in this chamber. For Ibrahim, there was no way out. Only servants who were deaf-mute could enter. Ibrahim had his own modest harem, but the fate of the women who entered it was similar to his own. They were confined within these walls for eternity and had no right to leave the premises. All possible measures were taken to prevent pregnancy, and if one of them happened to become pregnant against all prohibitions, she faced death. The institution of the cage was established by the order of Ahmed I in opposition to the law of Fatih. Over the next 200 years, numerous princes, some of whom spent more than 50 years of their lives here, sat in these dark cells. Ibrahim spent 22 long years here, day by day, awaiting the inevitable arrival of his executioner. When they came for him, his internal rebellion flared with fury. He barricaded himself behind the cage's door, taking his concubines with him. The prince was ready to resist, and no one could persuade Ibrahim to open the door. Finally, the vizier brought the body of the deceased Sultan Murad to the courtyard of the cage and asked Ibrahim to appear on the upper floor and look down. Only after Ibrahim saw the body of his brother did he emerge from the gloomy cell with an expression of joy on his face. He fell into wild and unrestrained merriment, dancing fervently around his brother's corpse and shouting, The butcher is finally dead! As soon as Ibrahim took power into his hands, he became the most greedy and corrupt of all Ottoman sultans. His thirst for power and shamelessness gave rise to tales in which he appeared as a true devil. Greed, drunkenness and madness became almost mythical attributes associated with him. His mother, Kursum, relentlessly supplied Ibrahim with fresh, innocent girls, and behind this lay one reason. She was waiting for an heir, which had not yet appeared. If Ibrahim did not provide the empire with a legitimate heir, it could mean its downfall. Two years after he ascended the throne and met a girl named Turhan, the long-awaited news of this slave's pregnancy arrived. One day, word reached Ibrahim that the most exquisite girl had been found in Istanbul. The Sultan wished to meet her and ordered her to be brought to him. However, it turned out that this girl was the daughter of a respected Mufti. The Sultan sent his envoys to the Mufti with a request to hand over the girl for his harem. Based on religious beliefs, the Mufti declined. The girl herself politely but firmly refused the Sultan's proposal. The Sultan was not about to give up. He ordered his servants to keep an eye on the girl and ultimately he had her abducted and brought to his palace. 
Despite her resistance, she was detained in the palace for some time and subjected to violence and other horrifying acts referred to as strange. She was then returned to her father's home. After eight years in power, the Sultan committed an incredible act. It all began with rumors when a pasha brought word that one of the concubines had allegedly been seen in an intimate situation with a man. There was no information available regarding the details of what had occurred, and no evidence was presented. It's possible that this incident never happened, given the presence of eunuchs in the harem whose role was to prevent such intimate liaisons. However, Ibrahim had heard stories of even royal wives engaging in relationships with eunuchs, and he believed the Pasha. The true origin of this rumor remained shrouded in mystery, but Ibrahim was convinced that he had been betrayed, and many girls in the harem were subjected to cruel interrogations and investigations. Ibrahim wandered through the palace, sighing heavily for days on end. Several days after this incident, a harsh punishment was imposed on the harem. The scale of the punishment was immense. At that time, the punishment for men involved strangulation using an oil-soaked cord, while for women, the punishment consisted of being dressed in sacks and having stones tied to their legs, after which they were cast into the sea. However, before this date, and in the subsequent period, there had been no such massive, large-scale punishments. Ibrahim decided that all of the 280 concubines in the palace would be drowned in the sea with stones tied to their feet. The women were placed in sacks and taken out to sea in groups on a boat. One of the concubines managed to escape. She was rescued and placed on a boat headed for France. This woman shared all the horrors that took place in the palace with those on board. Unfortunately, her accounts were not believed. At that time, in Istanbul, fishermen went to the bottom of the Bosphorus in search of pearls. One day, a fisherman accidentally discovered a terrible sight. When he descended to the bottom of the sea, where he expected to find pearls, he discovered many vertical bags with female corpses tied to stones. These bags resembled a strange forest, slowly swaying to the rhythm of the water currents. With these pieces of evidence, the Mufti, who was already dissatisfied with the Sultan, took decisive action. He managed to unite the Sheikh al Islam, Janissaries, and other supporters. Soon, the seven year old son of Turan Mehmed became the heir to the Sultan. People began accusing Ibrahim of depleting the Ottoman Empire through plunder and cruelty. The treasury was empty, and the people were in horror. Enemy armies besieged border cities, and the Dardanelles were under siege. Kosum's mother tried to resolve the situation, but in the end, she agreed to the abdication of the Sultan and the rise to power of the underage prince. Later, the Sheikh Ul Islam and Mufti addressed the crowd outside the Hagia Sophia, and their decision was accepted without objections. The Janissaries came to Ibrahim's door and briefly explained the decision. Ibrahim calmly accepted it, realizing that he had lost power, and he was returned to the cage where he would reside until he was needed as a ruler. However, this was not enough for the Mufti. He convened the religious council and they decided on the Sultan's death. When they arrived at his door, Ibrahim offered no resistance, believing that he would soon return to power. Therefore, the Sultan did not close the door, as he had done eight years ago, but this time, the guests had come with an oil-soaked cord. 